everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. That's right. We had Martin Luther King Day off today. I hope you all took some time and reflected on what's really important and hopefully we'll be more driven by peace and love over the next few days versus hate and anger. So um, we will uh, watch with bated breath as what happens tomorrow for the inauguration. Who knows what's going to happen? All I know is I've lightened up on some of my positions just to get out in case something crazy happens out there. We'll talk more about some of my positions maybe and uh, of course a lot of listener questions that have rolled in. So again, uh, hello everybody. Big Gab. Ellen. Hello, Detroit. We've got a new one in with us today. Uh, Terry, Jerry, oh, I'm even poetically rhyming there. Terry, Jerry, Mark, Ivzy, uh, Vasile, Vernon, Tom as well. Good to have you regulars in here. Jorge, Alex, Big Ab, and Les from Cape Canaveral. Good to have you all with us. All right, today's topic is, well, we'll start off with the big umbrella here, which will be bonds and interest rates. Uh, we've been talking about this steepening with Bill Addis recently, and of course, he's joining me today. So, Bill, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to be here, Roland. Thanks for asking me. Always good to have you with us. Um, what's new in your world? Do you do anything? I know last time I spoke with you, you were working on a um, signature series for Online Trading Academy. That hasn't been taught yet, no. or is it? No, coming? we're we're into our third one. And in fact, we got one coming up at the first week in February. So no, that'll be number four. So yeah, we've got these three day series called Bond Aid that we put together for the OTA community on bonds, interest rates, the Fed, and the U.S. economy. You know, a small little topic. So we can cover three days in that. Yeah, just a tiny little topic out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got a few questions that I want to get to in a, in a minute. But uh, when back a couple of years ago when you were on Power Trading Radio, we talked a bit about um, this declining rate environment. And it was one of those things yeah. that the feeling was rates are going to continue to drop. It's in the, you know, it's 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 going to stimulate the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and right. we looked at a variety of different products to capitalize on that. Now, all of a sudden, you know, the, the story seems to have aggressively changed. I certainly, from the past few conversations that you and I have had, it's more about rates are going up and it almost... We, two years ago, you are saying almost a foregone conclusion that rates are going down, and now it almost seems the exact opposite now. Am I correct? You are 100% correct. That's why, you know, I worry that some of the products like the YouTubes we did had a long shelf life out there, <laughs> that people are going to think, you know, rates are going down. No, 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 no. That's an old tape. Uh, in this market environment, and here we are a year and two later, rates are going up. And, and it's not a question, are rates going to go up? Rates have started to go up. Yeah. And, you know, the thing I like to qualify every time we do this is, you know, when we talk about interest rates, though, I like to qualify what interest rates. Because, you know, the thing I continually stress is all interest rates are not alike. Correct. Yeah. You know, we, we got short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates, credit rates, non-credit rates. So when I say, and we've been talking about interest rates going up, we're specifically talking about long-term interest rates. Mm -hmm. Right? That the long end of the market. Because when it comes to the bond market, the Fed controls the short end. You know, we, we've had that discussion about the Fed has said they're going to keep short-term interest rates at zero. And, and literally with unprecedented clarity, our Fed has never been this transparent. Our Fed has told us going out for the next two years, they don't see interest rates going higher. And even if inflation does start ticking up a little bit, they have told us in advance, they're not gonna be as quick to respond as they were in years past. Mm -hmm. so, so literally with unprecedented clarity, the Fed has told us short-term interest rates are gonna remain at zero. So, so they're holding short ends there but what's happening is long rates are going up. And, and they're going up fairly quickly and fairly dramatically. And, and I think they're going to go higher, quite frankly. I do as well. And I, I'm going to bring up, uh, you sent a couple charts here. I'll show one of them. This is the, the first, there were two treasury yield curve charts you sent me. And they were almost identical. So I wasn't sure what the, what the difference was. But we can get to that. Um, but this first one, for the viewers out there and for the podcasters, don't get to see this. Um, I'll walk you through kind of what it is. In January 2019, he was kind of marked out what the rates were for that period of time. And what I'm looking at is a spectrum from the short term, which is one month to 30 year on the right hand side of the screen. And what Bill said there is pretty important. The right hand side of the screen, the 30 years, the 20, the 10, that is driven by supply and demand, right? So that, that has a lot more fluctuation to it. When you look at the left-hand side, which is that treasury yield curve, that's not driven by supply and demand. That's the Fed going, this is where it's going to start. And, and they have that power. And whether you like it or not is, is irrelevant. It is what it is. So the treasury controls that. And in the 2019 line that you see, which I'm colorblind, so I'm going to say is like a light gray. It's, it's the top one. We were pretty much a normal yield curve at right around 2.5% up to about 3%. 
that, that, that was you know normal for the time. Then you can see what happened in 2020. We dropped down significantly, one full percentage point, but the line looks the same. It's the same trajectory and slope and just one percentage point lower. Now what's interesting is the, the current status of this is that short term, you're, you're pretty much pegged at 25 basis points to zero. And notice the curve does not look the same anymore. It is much, much steeper. We go from on the one month end, about 25 basis points, to on the 30 year, almost 2%. That is a pretty significant difference. Now, it's not out of line. It's normal to have rates rise for the longer term. I guess to me what's concerning is the trajectory, the steepness of this and how quickly it's turned around over the past couple of months. Yeah, and I have to reiterate, Marlon, great synopsis. It is 100% driven by supply and demand. That's what we have to look at. And, you know, just to bring your, your readers back to the foundation of this discussion, you know, we're, we're operating last year at a huge deficit. Mm -hmm. The government has to borrow boatloads of money. I mean, you know, last week alone, we had $360 billion of new treasuries come into the market. Including the 10 year, we had 38 billion of new 10 years come into the market, and we had 24 billion of 30 year bonds come into the market. So we're getting a lot of supply in the market. And, you know, it's like anything else a lot of supply usually bodes for lower prices, which in the bond market means yields are going higher. Mm -hmm. Or look at it another way the government's going to have to pay more and more interest rates to find more and more yield, rather, more and more coupon to attract investors with all of these treasuries that we're bringing to market. And, and, you know, the, the, the benchmark I use, as we mentioned, I did the signature series. This is the fourth one coming up in February. The first one was done in September. And, you know, we were doing a conference. You and I were doing a, a series of these back then. And we were talking that it looks like, given the supply and the rent, long-term rates are poised to go higher. And when we had that discussion back in September, the yield on the 10-year Treasury was 0.53%. I went back in my notes. I mean, here we are today, three months later, the yield on the 10-year Treasury is at 1.1%. Mm -hmm. It's more than double. It's mm -hmm. up 50, 50 basis points. So it's not a question, are interest rates going to go higher? They're starting, but specifically long-term interest rates. That's the emphasis. Yeah. Um, let me show you here for the viewers at home. You can't see this, Bill. What I'm showing is the this is the actual yield. For, let me get the, the screen up there for you. This is the yield on, we'll look at two of them, the 10-year and the 30 year. Of course, the 30 year obviously is the longest maturity that's out there right now for the US. Um, but you can see back here in March of 2020, we bottomed out at about 0.35. That, that's pretty phenomenal. That's the yield. Now, all of a sudden, we go from 0.35. And, and that was pandemic, by the way. That, that was, was pandemic. To the pandemic. Yep. That flight to safety when the pandemic hit. Sorry. Sorry. No, I interject anytime. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of based there for a while. Now, all of a sudden, if you look from those August lows, we could draw a line right across the bottom here, which, of course, course I will do that since we have the technology you know you could draw a line right across the bottom of those look that is the the quintessential definition of an uptrend series of lower high or higher highs and higher lows um, and then when I look at the bigger picture here this is where it gets interesting that bigger picture shows a, a dramatic turn right it has not had a turn like this since back in 2016 or 17 really so this um, you know my gut tells me that the the short-term rate era is potentially over at least for right now. I mean, we could certainly stay low, Bill, because I know that historical rates, you know, we, we, you stay down below 3% for the 30 year or 10 year, that's great. I mean, that's a phenomenal rate. But, you know, we're so, uh, I guess we're so greedy at this point. We're so used to having, oh, 50 basis points on my 10 year? Yes. You know, let's refinance. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that is, that is the issue. And by the way, I would point out you mentioned refinance. You know, normally the 10 year treasury acts as the benchmark for mortgage rates. We've had that discussion. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, you know, while rates are going up, there's a lot of demand for mortgage money out there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as a result, rates of mortgage rates have not gone up as much as you might expect. You know, we're up 50 basis points from the level, actually from your point, 60 basis points, right, from March mm -hmm. on the 10-year Treasury, yet 30-year mortgages are still remaining under 3% as a national average. Yeah. So we've had a little bit of a disjoint there because, you know, right now, as you know, what's going on in the real estate market in many areas of the country, there's strong demand for mortgage money. So it's keeping rates a little bit buffered lower. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's actually, you know, I, I guess since we're on that question, let me bring it up. There was a question that came through from somebody. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, and here it is. Um, 
Karen says, question for Merlin and Bill. If you feel that rates are going up, when should you refinance? I'm currently in a 30 year at 4.25%. Okay, so you gave me some criteria to work there with Karen. You know, what do you say here, Bill? You got a situation where we're seeing rates increase. You and I both feel these are rates are gonna continue to be moving up. What would you do if you're in a situation where you're locked in in a 30 year mortgage at four and a quarter? Well, you know, unfortunately, if we look at, and again, every market is local, is different. So, you know, I have to speak in terms of generalities. But the problem is if you've got a 4.35 fixed, and now the national average for 30 years is just starting to tick back up again. I mean, the reality is hindsight is 2020. You've missed the bottom. Yeah. You know, that, that's the fact. You know, mortgage rates were at two and three quarters at one point, but you're still not far off the bottom. You know, the problem is not knowing the terms of her individual mortgage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the difference between 4.35 and 3%, where we are now of 135 basis points, if she could get 3%, is enough to warrant refinancing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the problem you've got. You don't have enough buffer there. You don't have enough savings. So, you know, I would ask you, I would suggest you go back to the bank, run the numbers at 3% and see what type of a savings that does. I, I also assume that's 4.35 fixed. Yeah. Now, if that's 4.35 float, you want to get out of float. Yeah. Right. You don't want to be a payer of float in a rising interest rate environment. <laughs> so I, I would say that to everyone who's listening, you know, in a rising interest rate environment, depending on what you're floating based on, mm -hmm. you don't want to be an owner of uh, floating rate obligations in a rising interest rate environment. So you might think of converting to fixed mortgages. Yeah, I think uh, for Karen out there, look, at four and a quarter, Bill's right. It, it all depends on, on how long you plan on being in that home, how much is left on the loan. In general, if you're saving over a full percentage point, it's probably in your best interest, most likely. But again, depends on the time out there. You know, for example, I plan on staying in this place I'm in for quite some time. If I was in a four and a quarter and I could currently get sub three, I would probably refinance because hey, take a look at this graphic. I found this graphic today after I read that question from Karen and I, and I thought it would be pretty cool. This is the 30 year mortgage uh, rate chart. And Billy, I know you can't see it, but you know, back in 2018, we're looking about 4.94%. That was the high. So if Karen's in here at four and a quarter, that was, you maybe you refinance back in February, March of 2019, but it's been drifting down ever since. The low from 2019, 3.49, and then the low, the all-time low, 2.65 on January 7th, 2021. And what's interesting is here's the forecast for it going forward. You can see that the the general consensus is we are going to rise over the next few months. This is only for the next 90 days. I think that if you took this longer term and you know, someone did a forecast for let's say two or three years, you're probably looking at getting back up to the three, 4% range yeah, over absolutely. the next few years. So, you know, um, if you plan on holding the house for a long time, Karen, I, I think that you're probably better off to refinance. But again, run the numbers and see what works best for you. Bill said, go to the bank and do it. I would say, don't go to the bank and do it because they're gonna go, refinance because I make commission yeah. off you <laughs> bling 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 <laughs> Good but point. but Good there's point. a lot of great calculators out there that can help you figure out you know what's what's that break-even point and, and there will be a break-even point it, it'll be like you know if you have the house for if you can stay there for three years after three years then you're making positive cash flow on or it, it benefits you but you have to figure out what that time frame is all right. Uh, question for Bill. This is from Big App in our, in our chat out there. Um, it says, does this lead to higher inflation eventually with Treasury rates increasing? Well, it, it's kind of the other way around. What will lead to a rise in short-term rates is when inflation kind of starts rearing its ugly head and the Fed will ultimately start reacting to that. So it's kind of the tail wagging the dog. So um, I, I do think inflation, and again, opinion, I do think inflation is going to start rearing its ugly head. You know, and we even saw it last month. You know, if you look at the num no, the December inflation numbers that were released last mm -hmm. week, you know, inflation was running at four tenths of one percent for the month. Um, that's a that's a five percent inflation rate. Now, mm -hmm. granted, energy was about sixty percent of that because we know we had big fuel prices. But you know, in, inflation is starting to rear its ugly head. In, in spite of and, I, and I've taken this as the Merlin argument. <laughs> in, in my signature series last month, I was talking about inflation, and somebody said, "Yeah, but you know, we don't see it because the size of the soda cans are getting smaller, mm -hmm. and they're charging you the same." And I was like, "That's the Merlin argument." <laughs> Um, so it's you, true. You know, oh, it is very true. But I credit you with that all the time. But even of that aside, I, I do think based on what the Fed has been doing, I mean, you know, again, they pumped three trillion dollars worth of cash into our economy. 
I, I have to believe at some point our economy is going to start revving up on all this liquidity. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start seeing inflation. That, that is my conviction. But again, I stress, when inflation starts rearing its ugly head, in the past, the Fed used to be so quick to clamp down on it. Right. You know, they were so worried about the, Fed, the inflation is this horrible thing. Well, you know, we've got so little inflation now. The Fed has acknowledged, even when it does start churning up again, when it does, they're not going to be so quick to respond. Yeah. So that that's a big difference on the Fed, them, them telling us in advance what they expect to do. This is more transparency than we've ever seen. Yeah, uh, it, it's a tricky question uh, with regards to the inflation thing. I mean, I don't know if it's just the interest rates. So certainly the money supply is one of the major things that, to me, that's going to impact the inflation. But right. you know what? I, I am a student, and I, and I say student simply because I went to school for this. I'm a student of Keynesian economics because that's what American universities are taught. And they'll tell you that when you have a situation with this significantly increased money supply, inflation is right around the corner. And I'm sorry for the sensitive ears out there. I call bullshit because it's been – we've had the greatest money printing decade ever. And I have not seen this hyperinflation that every single textbook I read about says it's coming. I've been waiting. I've, I've had some short positions freaking out saying, oh, we're getting back to those 16%, you know, 30-year uh, fixed mortgages like you had in the 80s. We ain't seeing nothing like we're record lows. So, oh. yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm starting to stu study more of uh, the Austrian economic side of things out there with regards to it. So, um, John, o Don John O'Donnell's getting to you. I know. He's probably uh, all ooh. excited right now. He's just, <laughs> the, the telekinesis is... <laughs> Oh, it's a great argument, as is modern monetary theory. You know, we've got a whole bunch of different economic theories out there, but I'm going to throw in my two cents because I, too, am a Keynesian, you know, classically trained for whatever yeah. that's worth. Um, I think the lack of inflation, though, is really due to the fact that the economy is actually much more stagnant than we think, than we give it credit for. You know, because you, you look at all virtually any metrics, we're not seeing a strong economy, we'll admit that. And yet, as you just said, we've got $7 trillion of extra cash out there, mm -hmm. you know, so it is my fear that it's almost acting like a, a pressure boiler, that when the economy does actually start getting strong, and we're a ways away from that in my opinion, that's when we're going to see that velocity of money start increasing. Because inflation is not just the measurement of how much money's out there. As you said, that's M1, right? Mm -hmm. We can measure that. That's not inflation. Yeah, there's boatloads of money out there. We got a lot of M1 in the system. Inflation's going to happen when we start getting a higher turnover to that money. And that's what, we're, that's what we haven't seen for 10 years, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, there's a good question or comment to that. It says, uh, Chris says, does the high term increase, and I think what you means is high maturity, like the 30 or 20 tens, um, does that high term increase, uh, does a high term increase in rate influence the Dixie, the dollar index? So let, let's maybe take a step back and say, how does, how does this record amount of 10 years and 30 years and 20 years, how does that impact the dollar itself? And then we can look at the index. Yeah, no, great, great question from, from your listeners. You know, traditionally, a rising interest rate environment is good for the dollar, right? It makes it more attractive from an income point of view. Um, but, but, you know, the, the screwed up part of this in today's world is when you say a stronger dollar, you also have to raise the question relative to what? You know, mm -hmm. because right now, you know, the, the dollar is, you know, looking weak relative to the euro. But the euro is also going down relative to other things because euro is also doing quantitative easing and printing up euros just like we're printing up money. You know, and so when we start talking about the dollar on a relative basis, it's almost like the discussion we were just having about traditional Keynesian economics being thrown out the window. You know, we've got the Fed printing up all of this money. That should be driving the value of the dollar down, which it has been, right? Mm -hmm. But then as we've got currency, we've got interest rates going higher, that traditionally would lend to upward pressure for the dollar. But as interest rates are going to be going higher, as they are, it is quite conceivable that the Fed is going to come in with more stimulus. You know, they're not done with doing their quantitative right. easing. So in spite of rising interest rates, we could have the Fed printing more money and throwing it in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's going to be an interesting time. So on the one hand, you know, I can say to you the dollar is getting weaker because we're printing so many dollars in quantitative easing. The other is with rising interest rates, the dollar should get stronger. We got these two competing right. forces going on in the marketplace. And, and who wins is a crapshoot. I, I know who's going to win. 
I know. It's the <laughs> Fed. Hard. You you can't. Oh, you, the Fed's gonna win. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> here comes traditional supply and demand mechanics, and the Fed's like, here, hold my beer, and they just crush the whole damn thing. So yeah. no, um, right. the Fed is the Fed is the controller. The Fed is absolutely control, and it's a great quest, uh, question, Christy, because. Yeah. You know, as more dollars are put in circulation, you know, obviously that dilutes the purchasing power of it. But uh, Bill's right, as those yields go up. So if if a foreigner was holding U.S. dollars, which it's the reserve currency of the world, so there's a lot of people holding dollars, that yield they're not they're not making much. But now all of a sudden, in the past six months, it's doubled. So their interest to hold more dollars now is going to increase, right? Because they're thinking, hey, I'm getting more money by holding dollars. It's one of the safer currencies. I, I, I want to hold that because I potentially could make more money. And as that continues to go higher, what will happen is people who are holding other currencies, like the Canadian dollar, which is giving you 25 basis points, they might sell those Canadian dollars and buy US dollars to get the yield. It's called the carry trade, kind of holding to get the currency arbitrage. Um, and, and right now, Bill's absolutely right. We're at that point where it's like, I don't know which way it's going to go, right? The, the money printing says dollars going down, but the yields say that money will come back into the dollar. We're going to have to wait and kind of see how this one pans out over the next few months. But I do think that it, it sums up to one basic term for me, which is transition. And I think that that downtrend we saw on that 30-year mortgages, the 10-year as well, the yield's starting to rise. I think we're in transition right now. And I think over the next three to six months, we'll wait and see what happens with those yields and see how they, do they base or do we see an acceleration? That will give you your answer right there. Yep. And honestly, Merlin, your audience and we, you know, we were kind of pleased. I was pleased that we started having this conversation right after the pandemic hit. You know, in terms of all of the supply that was going to have to start hitting the market by the end of the year, the fact that rates were going higher. And, and, and you know, honestly, it was a good call. Um, and it's now become the prevalent call. You know, right now, what we're saying here is not as novel as it was six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Goldman Sachs recently came out with their institutional quarterly update to their clients. They're saying at one and a quarter percent yield on the 10 year is the next move, going to one and a half percent by the end of the year. That's kind of pretty much where I am. And that's becoming much more of a consensus view. So, so what it does mean, though, with the prospect of higher rates, you know, I talk a lot with the OTA community about creating ladders and that you can buy bonds yourself. And, you know, we, we've been getting the OTA community more familiar with the in bond culture. What, what we're really saying, though, in today's world, with those long-term rates poised to go higher, you shouldn't necessarily be in a rush if you're looking to be a long-term buyer for income. Mm hmm Right, you'd be better off waiting a bit rather than jumping the gun, right. and that's a, that's a very different point of view than what we've had up until this year. Absolutely, uh, Chrissy. Another great question. She says, uh, "If the pro isn't the price of Bitcoin not reflected as inflation, Chrissy, you got to look at it this way." Inflation to me is not, there's two different inflations. There is the infl um, the inflation of an asset price category like Bitcoin. So you could argue that the price has been inflated. But they can't inflate the number of Bitcoin. That's the difference. You can inflate the number of dollars, right? So we're seeing that with the Fed. They're increasing the money supply more and more and more and more and more. That's them manipulating the money supply. With Bitcoin, you cannot manipulate the supply. There is a fixed amount at 21 million. That's what there will ever be. I think there's 18 million in circulation right now. Apparently, 5 million of those have ceased to move, meaning people probably lost their private keys. So all of a sudden, supply is actually dropping. So don't confuse um, an asset's uh, amount inflation, meaning the, the number that are out there versus price inflation. Yes, Bitcoin has absolutely gone parabolic, but that isn't, I don't think that's a result of inflation. I would argue the opposite. It's right. a it's a result of people looking at it going, it can't be inflated by them diluting the number of Bitcoin and printing more and more, which is why you're seeing a lot of people buy. You're seeing a lot of CEOs of companies put their balance sheets in cryptos and Bitcoin in particular, because they're not going to be subject to the dollar manipulation by the Fed. And that's just, I think, one of the current trends. Yep, I absolutely agree. I, I also, well, and you, you sparked something before I want to go back to if I could, because you were talking about the demand for our treasuries. Yep. You know, I, I, I would ask the listeners to remember, you know, when you look out at the rest of the world, 30% of the world's government bonds are negative yielding, right? Negative interest wow. rates. You know, the, the 10-year treasury at 1% might not seem attractive at first glance. You know, actually for the last couple of years it is, but you know, for anybody who has a long memory, 1% might not seem all that attractive for a one for a 10-year investment. But yet if you look at the German Bund right now, the yield on the German 10-year Bund bond is negative 50 basis points. 
the entire German yield curve is negative. Mm -hmm. So exactly as you said, this carry trade, a lot of investors are buying U.S. sovereign debt because at least with the U.S., you're getting a positive rate of interest. Right. Now, again, there's a currency play there, but there are also ways of hedging out some of that risk institutionally. But, you know, the fact that the rest of the world, their bonds are negative yielding, that makes our bonds look even more attractive. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, guys, could you imagine? You imagine, in the, maybe it's, like, who knows? It could be down the road where you, you, you're you out with your real estate agent, you find this beautiful three-bedroom, four-bath home, and you're like, oh, man, this is the place for me. It's got five acres, and it's $300,000. So you put your, your $60,000 down, you pull out your mortgage for three hundred or $240,000, and they're like, well, it's a negative 1%. Right. Like, well, hold on a second. So basically, I don't have to pay you back that 240. I can pay you back like 210. Yeah, that's yeah. the way it works. Bizarre to think that could possibly be on the horizon, but that's the way it's working for some of these uh, some of these people that are buying. That, that's exactly as you said, Merlin. That's not theoretical. That's exactly what's going on in Denmark today. Denmark has <laughs> negative mortgages, not just negative interest rates. <laughs> negative mortgages. You don't have to pay back the bank as much as you borrow. Why aren't we all in Denmark buying houses? I know why. I've eaten Den Danish food before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, some of the stuff they're eating up there is pretty wild. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so much to do with herring and uh, cream sauce. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of pickled herring. My mother, she'd be like slurping pickled herring all day long, but I can't touch it. No. Um, what's another good one here from Richard? Uh, Bill, would you agree that some inflation is good for the growth of the economy? Oh. This, Absolutely. And whoever asked that question, great. You know, we, we all kind of grew up thinking inflation is this huge negative. No. Inflation in manageable measurements is good. We want inflation. You know, and I would say to your, list, your readers, your listeners, you know, don't you want your salary to go up every year? I'd love it. Yeah, I, keep going. Yeah, keep going. That's inflationary. Don't you want the value of your assets like houses or collectibles to go up every year, real estate to go up every year? I do. Mm -hmm. Those are positive inflationary pressures. I mean, we want inflation. The Fed has even said they've given us 2% as the magic number. You know, any, level, any inflation under 2%, the Fed is still going to be comfortable and it could go up as high as 2 traditionally. Now they're saying they might even let it go higher. But, you know, it's, it's unmanageable inflation is the problem. Mm -hmm. Manageable inflation is exactly what we all want, you know, you and I included. Yeah. And the market. Yeah, and definitely, definitely the market. Uh, Alan, great question. Alan says, how are the European banks making money with negative interest rates? That's the big coin under. It, it is basically saying, I, 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 I'm so afraid of holding these this money that I'd rather lend it out to you and, and lose a percent on it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you look at the earnings, quite frankly, because we got the banks reporting their earnings this week, I'm sure you've been going over with your mm -hmm. listeners. A lot of the revenue from the banking side, even here in the U.S., is coming from investment banking and trading activity. Yeah. It's not traditional lending activity any longer. Their loan books are very small. It, it's the other activities that are making them the money, specifically trading and investment banking. You know, it's funny because the only one that really had, that reacted very positively so far this week or last week with regards to earnings was JP Morgan. Uh, and they cited that their credit loan was where they did most of their activities. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So yeah. people, people le yeah. lending it out. Yeah, it was good to see. They're actually finally getting into the banking business. But remember, with a positive yield curve, we should expect the U.S. banks to start lending more. Mm -hmm. You know, the big problem for banks, I would remind people, is not necessarily the interest rate, but the slope of the curve. Because traditionally, banks borrow short term and lend long term. So if you have a flat yield curve, the yields that they're borrowing at are the same as the yields that they're lending at. Or an inverted yield curve is even worse, right? Like we had last year. They're borrowing short term, which is the high rate, lending long term, which is a low rate. That's a license for losing money. Right. So now that the yield curve is going positive, this should be very good for the bank and finance industry here in the US. Because now by long term interest rates going up, they're finally going to get paid to finally start lending long term. They haven't enjoyed that for the last three years. Yeah. So the shape of the yield curve is actually what affects banks' profitability more than anything else. I'm going to circle some stuff here. Uh, this goes back to 2019. This is that Treasury yield curve that you sent in. But to guys to illustrate what Bill was talking about, and you look at 2019, there wasn't a ton of lending going on. Um, you know, they were getting their short term short term from the Fed at under two two and a half percent. And then there's 3%. So they're really making a half or half a percentage point. There's not a lot of meat on that bone. Same thing for right. 2020. You're looking at about 1.5% selling it at two. For 30, you're, you're not getting much. Now you're looking at 25 basis points on the short end and 1.75 on the long one. I mean, you've tripled the profit margins there. Right. 
Um, so this is what's going to affect banks very positively on a going forward basis. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, yeah. And we'll see. Who knows how, how quickly that's going to change. I mentioned I had the uh, the tenure up here. This is the tenure. You guys can see the slope of that. Here's the 30-year as well, just to kind of put it into perspective. Like, it's not just the 10. You know, you are seeing those longer-term rates uh, definitely start to move up, whereas that short end is going to be pegged to zero for the foreseeable future because that's what the Fed has said that they're going to uh, be doing. One thing I'd also mention on this discussion, Merlin, if I could, is because we had Janet Yellen testifying in front of Congress today, you know, to become the Treasury Secretary. And under Steven Mnuchin, the Treasury Department had said that they were going to finance this deficit with long term bonds, you know, that we were going to hit the market with a lot of long term paper because interest rates are generally pretty low, obviously. So let's lock in that interest rate for a long period of time versus if we do it in the short end, we got to keep rolling over that debt and then we'd have interest rate risk there. So under Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, the deficit was being financed with lots of long-term bond offerings. The 10-year, 20-year, and 30-year were record offerings last year. So that could change under Janet Yellen. Now, we're not expecting that to change because remember, we have Janet Yellen's experience as the chairman of the FOMC right right before she was nominated as Treasury Secretary. So we know how she feels on issues. So we're expecting Janet Yellen to remain consistent of long-term offerings coming to market with great frequency, again, supporting the rising long-term rates. What might be a change is in the past, Janet Yellen has been very supportive of the idea of issuing 50-year treasuries. Wow. Yeah, you know, right now, 30 years is the longest we sell. And that's been the case for 35 years. But other governments have started selling 50-year paper. Europe is now selling 50-year paper. UK, Asia, 50-year paper, and that's becoming more the norm. And for whatever reason we don't really know, Stephen Mnuchin was not a fan of that. He let it be known that under his administration at the Treasury Department, we weren't going to have a 50-year. He's gone. Janet's going to be in. I'm sure her nomination will go through. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here in Washington. It's fun to watch all this stuff local. Um, but you know, Janet's nomination is going to go through, and that means we might get 50-year bonds come into the market. Now, for those of your your listeners who are volatility freaks, you know, who love volatility, mm-hmm. that's going to be a fun bond because that bond is going to experience an awful lot of volatility, an awful lot of duration. You know, if we get a 50-year bond, look for futures contracts then for a 50-year bond. Yeah. Um, and that's going to have a lot of volatility to it. It could be a very interesting piece of paper to keep an eye on if it happens. Gee, hell, people can't even figure out what the market's going to do in the next six months. Now you're going to be guessing it's 50 years out? <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Louise. So if you yeah. lock in that 50-year mortgage, guys. <laughs> well, but, but, but that is the evolution, exactly. Corporations will, now, once the government issues a 50-year bond, then we have a benchmark, right? Right. Then corporations can start issuing 50-year bonds. Municipalities can start issuing 50-year bonds. Um, it, it's going to really change our market and bring a lot more volatility into the market because those long-dated paper, those long-maturity bonds will have a lot of volatility to them, a lot of duration. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be fun. Yep. Uh, so the interesting comment from Naomi says, inflation causes your purchases to increase as well as your paycheck to lose purchasing power. I disagree. Uh, I'm not sure there. I, I think if, you're in, if your salary, if your wage is increasing at the normal inflation rate, then that means you can buy the exact same amount of stuff. So if right. there's a distinct uh, separation there between your paycheck um, inflation rate and the economy, then that's what you, your your gain or loss in your purchasing power. I don't think that inflation causes anybody to buy any more unless your paycheck is inflating, let's say, 5% a year and the average inflation rate is 2%. Then you've got a net 3% gain. You're going to be buying more. But I don't think standalone, uh, it, it means that you're automatically going to be buying more stuff. And, and again, we're speaking about an entire economy, not necessarily the individual, right? We're talking about corporations and so on. So, you know, what, what you and I might argue is an acceptable degree of inflation could be an interesting discussion. But I think what's more important is what does the Fed say? Yeah, right. You know, where are they going to respond to what the Fed has told us? is they view 2%, and this is not new, this has been the case for decades, they view 2% as not only an acceptable inflation level, but actually one they want to try and achieve. Right. Yeah, they've been saying 2% is the one they were trying to get, right? Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, all right, last one, and then we'll go to tell, you can tell me a little bit more about your class. Um, Alan says, curve steepening has followed the yield curve inversion in 2000 and 2008, and now, do you believe this means economic recovery? Oh, I, I, well, um, yes, I do think the bond market is saying that the worst of times are behind us. Yes. And because the bond market, as your reader is saying, has been historically a very accurate predictor of the economy. 
you know, we, we've had numerous discussions about those seven inverted yield curves. Yeah. That are eight now. Sorry, we've got to update our numbers to eight uh, to this year, last year. So we'd had eight inverted yield curves led to eight recessions. By the same token, a positive slope yield curve is indicating the prospect of greater inflation over time. And what that's really pricing in is economic activity, right? Because we put those two hand in hand. So you're absolutely right, the reader. The, the steeper the yield curve, that's really the market predicting a stronger and stronger economy. Now, I do want to put this into some context. The yield curve, your, your listeners are watching, if they can see it. You know, yes, we have a steep yield curve. And yes, it's steeper than it's been in a while. But it's really not a hugely steep curve. As you said, you're at the difference between the highest point and the lowest point is only about 1.5%. Yeah. You know, so on a grand scale, historically speaking, there's not a huge velocity to this slope, but it's getting bigger, and the bigger it gets, that is the bond market expressing confidence that the economy is getting stronger, yes. Yeah, I'm drawing yeah. it on with my wonderful penmanship <laughs> abilities. One point by one point. Yeah, I'm trying to draw in PowerPoint with a cursor is just not my, my, my forte, that's, that's for one. damn sure. Um, and, and Medic, last comment here says, would Biden's plan of raising the minimum wage also cause inflation? Well, you got to think about what would happen there if you raise the minimum wage. Do you think that McDonald's or minimum wage employers are going to just like just accept it? No, that's going to pass. Your Big Mac's now going to go up by whatever uh, amount they need to offset that. So certainly that would cause some degree of inflation. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I thought oh, rise, the, rise in minimum wage is an inflationary tactic. Absolutely. You know, and I actually thought that we'd see much more inflationary pressure due to a lot of the tariffs uh, that were going on back in 2019 and 20, that whole tariff argument going on for a long time. Uh, I didn't see too much of a dramatic rise in a lot of things I thought. Actually, TVs, I noticed that for the 85 inches, they didn't drop. If you want to know about, you know, TVs, I, I've studied them for the past uh, year because I wanted to buy that 85 inch TV, which, I, by the way, I did not buy. I, I I said still too expensive. It is actually more expensive this year than it was last year for an 85-inch TV, which could do to impart to the tariffs out there. Uh, Bill, tell me a little bit about your signature series. I know you and I did a, a showcase. But I know about it, yeah. but maybe you can tell our viewers a little bit more about it. No, thank you, and thank you for taking the time that you did with us last month. Yeah. No. no what happened here is, um, you know, I've been bringing my background, which is as an institutional trader and, you know, market maker for Lehman Brothers for 23 years, and then having my own training firm for the last couple of years, you know, I've been taking my bond experience and using it for the OTA community. And for years, Merlin and I and others have been putting out videos and some newsletters just to educate the OTA community more on bonds. <coughs> Pardon me. And, and we've now evolved to a three-day part of the signature series. And the bias that I bring, again, it's called Bond Aid. It's a three-day class that gets into bonds, the U.S. economy, interest rates, and the Federal Reserve. Now, for many people who take the class, I never expect they're actually going to trade a bond. That's not their real mm -hmm. intention. But I would make you the argument, and we've had this discussion, I don't care what asset class you're trading. As we've been talking about here today, I don't care if you're trading currency, I don't care if you're trading commodities, I don't care if you're trading equities, all of them are impacted by the Fed, the US economy, and interest rates. You know, you don't have to be a bond person to be fluent on what the Fed is doing. You know, we saw it in March, right? When the Fed did the intervention they did in March, look what happened to the equity market, how it exploded to the upside. Well, how could you know what was going on if you didn't know what the Fed was up to? You know, even still, the Fed is boistering, I think, the equity markets. And, you know, the currency market, as we said, being affected by what the Fed is doing. So what I'm pleased by is that the class seems to have a broad audience. You know, there are some people who are there who want to know more about bonds and how to trade bonds mm -hmm. and how to trade bond ETFs. You know, that's where the class that I'm going to do on Monday, we have um, as part of the signature series, as I'm sure you're aware, we have the showcases where we do a little bit of the class every week as kind of a teaser lead in. So next Monday, I'm going to do a showcase, it's open to everybody, where we're going to talk about the bond ETFs, you know, the things like the TLT and the IEF, let's talk about bond ETFs. So there are people who want to trade interest rate products, and we do that, but I also think it's incumbent on anybody trading the market. If you're trading FX in the currency market, if you're trading commodities, if you're trading equities, I really do think there's such a contango, there's such a correlation in today's world between the different markets you'd be well served to know what the Fed is up to. Yeah. You'd be well served to know what's going on in our economy. So that's what we try and do in that three-day series. And I would encourage you to get in there as soon as you can because uh, Bill might be gone for one month working for a major financial firm. 
<laughs> yeah, my uh, my business has picked up. I have to confess, you know, the fact that I, I do training for the institutional marketplace. So last summer, for example, I was over at Goldman Sachs. I was at uh, HSBC. I was at uh, Smith Bar, uh, not Smith Barney, sorry, Citibank. <laughs> no, you have a little so flashback I, I, there. They still call themselves Smith Barney. There's a port of Citibank that still calls themselves Smith Barney. I slipped there. Um, but this year is going to be even busier. I'm going to spend a whole month with Citibank this year I'm um, doing they hire 3,000 globally wow. new employees um, through from grad programs you know young kids right out of college and I'll spend a month working with them before they go into their respective offices but you know now that the fact the world is virtual I can train in Japan just as easily as I can train in London as I can train in New York and, and that's exactly what I'll be doing for Citibank is training in those three geographies but just doing it from here in front of my computer so or from yeah, that, or from your sailboat or from my sailboat, very good, as you know, or from my sailboat. Uh, powerboat, I don't sail, I don't rely on nature. I'm from good. my powerboat. Yeah, um, it's funny because so my, no, my, my dad had a sailboat when I was younger and I always look back and go, it was great because I was so young I didn't have to do anything, but my goodness, what a labor intensive thing. Just get a powerboat and... <laughs> That's where I am. So yeah. what Merlin's referring to as one of my pandemic projects was my bucket list was to go move on to and live on a boat. And that's what I'm doing. So that's what I will be doing shortly. So yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Yeah. And I got to say, and I don't want to sound gratuitous, but working with OTA is my first experience of working with the retail investor. You know, my personal experience and my training experience has all been for the institutional market. And I've been really impressed by the caliber of the, of the questions and the dialogue. So, I mean, not that your audience has to care, but I'm really having a good time with the OTA community. So well, that's, that's part of why I do it. Well, it's funny. We, we Not funny, but we love having you on because it's... Uh... It's a perspective. I think it's probably one of the last asset classes that people think about trading, but I think it has a certain, you know, it, money makes the world go round. Without a debt market, without a bond market, our economies would cease. And and one That's more right. thing to add to this, for for example, uh, tonight when I win the Mega Millions Lotto, you know, you want to know about building a bond ladder so I can take, oh, let's see, I think my payout amount was going to be $560 million cash. Uh, I would probably take 200 million. I'll just take 100 million and build a bond letter, getting me let's say 4% per year. So I make four million dollars alone off of that. And then, you know, it's about it's about having that income stream. And yeah, you know, right. I want to make sure I have that set up. Bonds are the way to go. The only thing wrong with what you said is, unfortunately, you're going to be splitting the ticket with me because I thought I bought the winning ticket. So other than that, <laughs> you know what? You can do that with half the winnings. I am totally happy to do that. Even if I got okay. one one hundredth of those winnings, I'm like, I'm good with that. <laughs> uh, me too. We'll put our bond ladders together. Sounds good, Bill. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, best of luck to you in the Signature Series, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be talking to you next month. We will. Always a pleasure. My best to the audience. Stay healthy, stay happy, and have a great New Year. All right. Take care. You, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks, Marlon. Thanks. Guys, that was Bill Addis. He uh, teaches a signature series class for Online Training Academy. Fernando in here says he's going to be in that signature series. Well, congratulations. I will probably be in there as a fly on the wall as well. Um, I would say I was pretty bond ignorant. I knew the basics about bonds, but working with Bill over the last, gosh, three or four years now, um, it really just opened my eyes up to a different, a whole different world. Now, obviously, as a trader, I'm looking for generally greater rates of return. I like the risk and the volatility of the equity markets of futures, Forex, cryptos. But in our portfolio allocations, instead of arbitrarily buying and saying, hey, I want to uh, just have some money in bonds, there's much more strategic I get allocation that you could be putting in that bond portfolio. And that's something I learned from Bill is these barbells and ladders and different structures, uh, just great vehicles and ways to generate income streams, which if you follow me for any period of time, you know that it's not about how much money you have when you retire, it's about the different income streams that you have. How have you set things up to pay for your lifestyle or your desired income during retirement? Um, I think one of the big mistakes people make is they go, well, I wanna have $3 million by the time I retire. Is that enough? Well, what if you spend a million a year? You're done in three years. You know, it, it's not just the amount that you have. It's how have you set it up for those income streams coming in? And bonds to me was the, the big eye opener there. And also the structure, the way the Fed works, and just having some of his experience is pretty phenomenal. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you can contact tradingacademy.com. They'll uh, you talk to the local center and, and talk about the signature series. I do believe that course strategy is the prerequisite for that. So if you have done, not taken course strategy with Online Trading Academy, that is a prerequisite to get into Bill's class, I believe. All right, um, I actually had, what time is it? Oh man, we're gonna do another hour show. Big Ab, this is all your fault. Uh, let's see, there were two questions I wanted to get to that uh, pertain to stuff that happened today. We did the rates one. Let me go here. Um, this is for Alex, who's with us, since he was right at the very, very beginning of it. I figured I may as well answer his question. Alex says, if a stock has a gap, must that gap fill at, 
at some point, or can it keep going without the fill? For example, GEVO. First off, congrats on your GEVO trade, Alex. That's a that's a that one's just paying paying dividends for you, buddy. Let's bring up GEVO. GEVO. Uh, the the simple answer is no. Gaps don't have to fill. But over my trading career, I've heard this not only from all just about every mentor I've ever had, but also from my own observation generally most gaps are going to fill so you see this GEVO which has just been going absolutely nuts recently so congrats I'd take some money off the table honestly if I were you Alex on this one um, but he's referring to this big gap that happened this morning it gapped up from what about 640 yeah, six dollars and forty cents jumped up to eight eighty. I mean, that's a big gap by itself, but it just kept on going. Will this gap be filled at some point? Probably, probably, but I don't know. You know when, and it may never. There's there's gaps on Amazon that will never fill, right? Gaps on Amazon that happened, you know, fifteen years ago that will just never, never, never fill. That's. Uh, um, was going to use that to add more. Add more? You mean if it closes the gap? Yeah, if it closes the gap. But you know, this is one of those ones where you've got something that has gone absolutely parabolic. My gut feeling and my experience just tells me when something goes parabolic, you, you want to get out of it. Unless it's Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, then you just stay in that one forever. But uh, I'd definitely be careful on that one because it's gone so straight up. You know, let me, I haven't checked out the volume on this too. I'm, I'm sure volume is obviously really spiked up here. Let me add in volume just so the viewers out at home can check that one out. Actually, it's not really that big of an increase in volume. Um, I mean, today it was, but I would expect that this trend that's been going here would have much more to it, but it really doesn't. Uh, it seems to be trading about 25 million shares a day, which is a lot, by the way. Uh, but these big rallies up, they're not followed by big surges in volume. So well, I, I don't know. I GEVO doesn't have that uh, climactic move yet, that climactic volume. Uh, BGC is looking like a snack. <laughs> a snack? <laughs> is, that, is that his official pattern there, Alan? Let's go, let's go uh, at BTC. Uh, Bitcoin, yes, I still have my Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just forming this symmetrical triangle. It's forming a pendant formation, right? This is, we talked about this the other day. This is actually pretty good. It's, a, it's basically a moment where the security takes a second to, or a few days or weeks to breathe to consolidate, to build up some more demand again. Unless it starts making some new lows, this looks pretty attractive to me on Bitcoin. This is a symmetrical triangle. Uh, some call it a wedge formation, but that to me is uh, looking pretty darn good. Uh, let's see, what else did I have on there for listener questions? Let me see, I had one more I thought was, there were a couple good ones today. Oh, from Michael, who might be with us today. Michael said, uh, I sold five Netflix 570, 575s uh, and Netflix misses, and the stock is at 50 points and rising. Am I screwed or what? Just, just alone, this conversation here just has to have you going. What the hell is going on? I mean, what is going on? Um, you sold five of these bad boys. So we talked about this on the show the other day, where we basically brought up Netflix and FLX. Uh, here's your daily, and we we looked at this from this wider perspective. And I'm just going to put some lines across the top and bottom. And you guys may remember, we talked about that zone. And it's right between what, 467 and what's that top number out there, 567? So basically a $100 range. I said, look, this is a great place to be selling spreads on this, right? You could you know, sell some puts when it gets to the high, you could buy some calls when it gets down to these lows over here, or sell some puts when it's up higher. But this range bound since July of last year, that that's, I hate using the term because I'm sure the SEC would just be like, oh my gosh, you can't say that. But that's one of those like you know goose that lays the golden egg because you're just you you play the range right. Well, what happened today after earnings? Um, let, let's let me put a number on here. So I'll do these two top lines here because he said he sold the 570s and basically he bought the 575 and basically he's doing a spread trade on here and saying if it stays below 570, then you're great, right? No worries. So those two lines up there near the top are the ones that matter. Now let me get rid of my volume because that doesn't matter anymore. Um, bottom line is you want to stay below those two. Your maximum risk here is $2,500, right? $2,500 is your maximum risk. So, you know, potentially that could could get hit. If it ends up above 575, you're probably gonna be out 2,500 bucks. But where is it at right now? Well, I got Keith, uh, Nick, sorry, Nick is saying 562. Well, because we have the technology and I like to show the after hour stuff, here is what it did over the past few days on a five minute time frame. Now let's see what it's doing in the after hours session. Boom, hallelujah. It's a 563 right now and it hit a peak value. Let me turn this uh, dragging tool off. Hit a peak value of 
do 568 so honestly Michael I think you're okay I think you're probably okay on this one um, you know it really depends on what happens out there tomorrow it, it's interesting when we look at the the announcements that were made right there was certainly um, uh, I got I have to now I, I see the uh, Nick's here all right uh, Zach as well so I gotta get to Zach's question um, when you look at the earnings announcements and let me real quickly bring that up here as well so I can show it for you Here's your earnings that Netflix came out with today. And you can see they missed, right? They were supposed to come out with a buck 38 and they came out with a dollar 17. They missed by almost 14%. And you're thinking, oh my God, they're going to tank tomorrow. Well, they have 200 million subscribers. That's pretty amazing. That's an amazing feat for Netflix. So, you know, there's still this optimism that those 200 million subscribers are going to push up even more. That's really what this is all based on. My guess is you'll probably see it gap up pretty big tomorrow and then sell off. I think Big Ebb's got it right. I think it's a good shorting opportunity. I might be looking at some puts early in the morning, and if it does, if it rallies a little bit in the morning, making those puts a little bit cheaper, um, then I'll buy some out-of-the-money puts because my guess is you'll probably see that come back down. Um, and get back within that range. You know, the numbers support a declining market. And you notice that daily, you know, the numbers to me support this this sideways action. It's not really expanding quickly. It's actually declining. So my guess is you should actually be dropping down below 450 before, before below 460. Um, oh, the old Disney earnings. I built, is that next week? I think it's... Uh, I, I don't know. I got so many earnings numbers in my head. I've been doing earnings calendars for online trading academy, and I think that uh, I, they're either this week or next week over for Disney. All right, what else? There was a couple other questions that came through. Um, Ethereum today, gotta love Ethereum. Wow, you want to talk about cryptos just being the topic to draw. I, I try not to do too many shows on cryptos because I know some people actually hate it. So uh, here is your Ethereum. Looking great. Um, Ethereum, just parabolic all time highs. I mean, you talk about parabolic, this is it. But again to me this is just getting started and the main reason is once people start once companies and corporations start using the ethereum blockchain it puts further dependence on ethereum and solidifies its place not going to go away more money comes into ethereum i think that you got a much much bigger upside move here for ethereum going forward so yeah i'm pretty happy about it today because i think if i remember correctly this is my second largest position in my portfolio so let's go bitcoin let's do it <clears throat> what else do i have out here for you uh, Alan, I did not see the Ethereum Bitcoin chart that you sent me. Um, I'll bring it up on tomorrow's show. I'm a, a little bit behind here. I, I did not see. Oh, oh, you know what? But I didn't see that chart, but I did get your question. And um, this is a good one. I'll, I'll end up with this one because I think it's important for us as a group. Uh, Alan said, and this, he, by the way, he emailed me. You guys can all email me at tradermerlin.com or go to this address here which is tradermerlin at gmail.com. You can email me anytime you like, and a lot of you have been doing that, so I appreciate it. Alan says, uh, what do you make of the studies they've done saying day traders pretty much all fail? Did you see the high turnover in your days as a day trader? Yes, absolutely. I believe it 100%. The statistic that Bear Stearns came out with, and I tried to find this report. I cannot find it, but I remember back in the late 90s when I was starting out, I read a report by Bear Stearns that said that 93% of traders fail. 93%. That's an appallingly bad uh, success rate. At that rate, you may as well just start your own business because I think businesses have a better success rate within the first five years. Anyway, uh, yes, I saw turnover on a daily basis. But if you think, if you watch this show enough, I'm always import, importing, imparting discipline, risk management, and those types of things on you through, through the trades either that I'm talking about or trades I'm making and showing you or even your trades that you send me questions on because this is why most of those traders would leave. They would do stupid stuff. They would do dumb stuff that you just... After the fact, you look and go see what they did and be like, oh man, you idiot. What were you doing? What were you thinking? The strongest stock of the day is up 50% on the day and you decide to short 1,000 shares and take it home overnight. Then it gaps up 20% the next day and then continues to rally another 100% the next day and you added more to your position. That's stupid. So yeah, most people that do day trading fail, but it's changed a lot. And the reason it's changed is where it killed us was on commissions. I think I told you back in the late 90s, I was averaging 550 trades a day. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's stupid to trade that much now. Who was making more money? The guy that ran the brokerage firm. The guy that ran the trading floor was making the most money off me. I mean, like I said, I'd have a $10,000 day where I'd make 10 grand and I go back and look at my profit and loss for the day and it's like, I made $1,500? Where did the $8,500 go? Commissions. 
So when they removed the fees for most platforms now for equity trading, I think that gives you a little bit of an edge, you know, it gives you a little bit of extra skin to maybe make it, but I still think overall most day traders will fail. It's due to them being jigged out of positions, um, not being able to hold on to long winners. They usually cut their loss, uh, cut their winners short and let their losses run. That's the main kiss of death for most day traders out there. So that's your question. That's the question I got. But Alan, yeah, definitely do me a favor. Send me uh, that chart again because I didn't, I did not see that chart. Uh, what else do I got? Taco Tuesday. Oh, it is Taco Tuesday. You know what? I think tacos sound like a good idea for dinner. Um, Alice, that's why you find many prop firms shady. Yes. Not only do I find them shady, they're incur they're generally going to teach people how to trade in a, in a day trading manner, which means they're going to get commissions and fees off of that until you bleed your account dry and then you disappear. Uh, yeah, I'm not a really big... Jerry, that was many years ago. I don't do that a day at all now. Gosh, I might if I might do one or two a day. I'm very limited now on what I do. I'd rather take a step back and look at the big picture and, and move much slower. There's days like if I have a nice day off, I will uh oh it's on Messenger. Okay. I will do a lot more. But you know, I limit myself about eight years ago, I think it was, eight or nine years ago, I put a rule in my trading plan that says I cannot make more than twenty trades in a day. I don't even come close to that now. Not even on days when I'm off and I just have nothing to do but trade, um, you know, I, I don't make that many. I'd rather I'd rather do it from the sniper perspective. I've told you guys this many times. The sniper perspective is you've got a certain amount of shots. You got six shots in that gun or three shots or however many trades you want to limit yourself to per day. If you say it's three, then don't then only make three trades. But what will happen is you're going to be much more selective on those three trades that you do make. All right. I had a lot more stuff to talk about, but I, I got to get wrap this show up. I didn't realize it's going, going late over here. You guys, you see what happens when you get me talking and gabbing? Um, here's what we've got cooking for tomorrow. United Health coming out with earnings. You have Procter Gamble, Kinder Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Alcoa, United Airlines, and U.S. Bancorp. These are some of the major names reporting earnings. There will probably be, or sorry, there are many more than this uh, reporting earnings tomorrow, but those are some of the big names. On the economic announcement front, you have almost two pages worth. I had to put these side by side, right? You have a rate statement, come, a tentative rate statement coming out for Japan. That might be tomorrow night. You also have a uh, rate statement coming out for Canada. They're expected to stay the same, about 25 basis points. You guys can see that one over here. Um, that will be at, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So you're already talking a couple hours into the equity markets and when that announcement comes out. Not a lot of big stuff for the U.S. As you can see here, we do have the NAH, NAHB housing market index. Uh, and then Biden is tentative to speak tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I would encourage you guys to be careful out there tomorrow. Not just if you're in a big city because you're hearing about all these, you know, people are going to do terrorist stuff and be violent. Look, just take it easy out there tomorrow. Hopefully we get this nice peaceful transition. And as a country, we can just move forward whether you like this current administration or not doesn't matter. You probably said the same thing four years or said a different story four years ago. It is what it is. Let's all just move forward and make the most of it. For me, that means making better trades, planning better, and hopefully having a much better year. Yesterday was Last year was a pretty good one, but I, I like to make it, this a banner year I think it's going to be, so hopefully you do as well. All right, that's going to do it for me, everybody. Tomorrow, our guest is going to be Tilly Allison. She will be on the program tomorrow. She's got all kinds of stuff. She's actually getting some more securities licenses and doing all kinds of training, so we'll talk about that with her on tomorrow's show. If there's something you want me to talk about with Tilly tomorrow, send it on in at Trader Merlin. you got the email on the screen up here, which I'll put back up again. Uh, it's tradermerlin at gmail.com. I already have a few questions I did not get to, which I will get to on tomorrow's show. Um, but uh, hopefully you guys will all join us and click that little thumbs up button. Alan, Civil War 2.0, let's do it. No way. Come on. We don't need no Civil War. We can all get along. It's easy. All right. Now, that'll do it for me, everybody. Hope you had a great show. Hope you enjoyed Bill Addis. If you want to know more information about his signature series, go to tradingacademy.com to learn more about his bond class that's coming up. That said, I will see you guys tomorrow with Tilly Allison. Take care.